Hello everyone, I'm John Horrigan, and welcome to the Great Hurricane of 1938. Hope you enjoy this presentation. It's brought to you by our friends at the Wayland Council on Aging. So thank you so much for joining me. And hello to all of our friends watching on the Wayland Community Media Channel, Waycam. A disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed on Wacam Public Media are those of the author and do not necessarily reflect the official policy or position of the Wayland Council on Aging or Wayland Community Access and Media. Any content that I provide is of my own personal opinion and is not intended to malign any religion, ethnic group, club, organization, company, individual, or anyone or anything. It's a text-driven lecture, and this is for the benefit of folks who may have difficulty hearing or if you're a poor listener like me, and any audio or technical issues are on my end, but maybe one day I'll be able to make a live presentation to you at the Wayland Council on Aging. But until then, stay safe, stay happy, stay strong. Uh, John Horrigan, host and writer um, of a show called The Folklorist. You can still find it on the internet, uh, on YouTube, or go to folklorist.tv. I was lucky enough to be the recipient of five Boston New England Emmy Awards. I also received 20 nominations, 12 Telly Awards, seven communicator awards and then new tv in newton massachusetts who produced the folklorist went back to back in 2015 and 2016 first place arts and entertainment with the alliance of community media but the show was canceled in september 2016 as i said you can still find it on youtube the folklorist i've been called many things some i can't say in public but i have a long record uh, of being a professional sports announcer with the boston bruins alumni the national hockey league alumni new england patriots alumni and I was lucky enough to call a Red Sox game uh, on the PA on June 5th, 2012. And I also announced two outdoor Winter Legends Classic hockey games at both Fenway Park and Gillette Stadium and Comedy Basketball Hall of Fame. But I'm also a historian. I love New England folklore, New England storms, disasters, American Revolution, world history, uh, economic history. I belong to a number of historical societies, including Marshfield, Watertown, Duxbury, the Society in Dedham for the Apprehension of Horse Thieves. They just have a dinner every year. Economic History Society, and also a former colonial reenactor with the Lincoln Minutemen, and I belong to a reenactors collaborative known as Solo Together. If you want to get a hold of me, no problem. Drop me an email at johnhorrigan at hotmail.com, or you can follow me on Facebook at J.R. Horrigan, John Horrigan, historian, pro sports announcer. So we're going to look at a snapshot. What is a hurricane? A history of North Atlantic hurricanes, the great colonial hurricane in the great September gale of 1815, the track of the hurricane, that summer of 1938, a muffed forecast, a record low air pressure, and then we track the storm when it goes from New York City to Long Island to Connecticut, we'll talk about the great New London fire, Rhode Island, and then a few stories and anecdotal stories, and then the Connecticut River Valley in Massachusetts. It hits Massachusetts, and then we'll look at the death of a monster. So in this presentation, we'll look at acts of bravery and acts of cowardice, acts of kindness and selfishness, providence, luck and cruel fate, and up until that time, the most costly disaster in U.S. history, and was called a lateral buzzsaw. And the problem is nobody was prepared because nobody was warned. There were unlikely heroes. By the time it died out on September 28th, a week later, 10 states and two countries were affected. Now to understand hurricanes, first let's start, start from tropical depressions. In, in New England, we get hit with tropical depressions and tropical storms, sometimes we don't even know it. Uh, tropical depression, 23 to 39 mile per hour winds. A tropical storm, 40 to 73 mile per hour. And anything over 74 miles per hour or above is a hurricane. And you have category one, two, three, four, and five. Category one, um, wind speeds up to 95 miles per hour. Cat two, 110 miles per hour. Cat 3, 130 miles per hour, Cat 4, 155 miles per hour, and Cat 5, catastrophic, greater than 155 miles per hour. And with that comes low air pressure and also storm surge. And Category 3 is 9 to 12 foot storm surges, Cat 4, 13 to 18 feet, and then Category 5, over 18 feet. Now, the last time we really were hit with severe storm surge and people in situate and uh, the, the South Coast can argue on this, but Hurricane Bob, which decimated the Cape Cod Canal regions of Wareham, Woods Hole, etc., that was in August of 91. 
But the hurricane damage is caused by three factors. The first is storm surge. It's a 40 to 60 mile long dome of water that's pushed ashore by the storms. And that's uh, nearly 90% of all hurricane related deaths and injuries occurred due to storm surge. In uh, India in 1876, 200,000 died of storm surge. In Haiphong, China in 1881, 300,000 died. Of course, there's wind damage. Wind can decimate the tree population, take down power wires, utility poles, knock over signs, knock over homes, houses, tear off roofs. Uh, tornadoes will form sometimes in hurricanes, and it's only a secondary cause as storm surge is the primary cause of damage. And then finally, rainfall and flooding. You get torrential rains that normally accompany a hurricane, and it can cause serious flooding. And sometimes uh, storms will stall over areas and just dump deluge of rain. And if you look at the vulnerable American coast, the East Coast, where the majority of uh, the United States population resides, it's right in Hurricane Alley from Florida and the Gulf Coast is, is certainly uh, receptive to hurricanes, but you can see that along the Gulf Coast all the way up to Boston, Massachusetts, and Portland, Maine. I like this chart because it gives you a 110 year overview of the paths of hurricanes from 1886 to 1996. Of course, they developed off the west coast of Africa and move um, to the west northwest, and then they hook and go to the north northeast. And you can just see some of them go right across the Gulf. Uh, some now hurricanes are forming in the Gulf of Mexico. Then they move up the coast. But you can see even places like Newfoundland is in the eye of the hurricane, even as far as Europe, Ireland, England uh, is susceptible uh, in France to hurricanes. Now, if we look at geological evidence, um, we can see that there were intense New England hurricane strikes during antiquity. And by analyzing the sedimentary deposits, we know that hurricanes struck the New England coast between the years of 1100 and 1150, the years of 1300 through 1400, also from 1400 to 1450. And then the other major hurricanes to strike the United States, or strike New England rather, are the great colonial hurricane of 1635 and the great September gale of 1815. I also throw in 1869, which is known as Saxon's gale. Now the great colonial hurricane, this is John Winthrop, August 16th struck 1635. That's the old style Julian calendar date, not our modern Gregorian calendar date. And Winthrop wrote, Governor John Winthrop, he said it blew with such violence with abundance of rain that it blew down many hundreds of trees, overthrew some houses and drove ships from their anchors. The tide rose at Narragansett 14 feet higher than ordinary and drowned eight Indians flying from their wigwams. And the uh, ship, the Angel Gabriel was destroyed off of uh, Cape Ann, 21 lives lost. So we know the eye passed to the south and east of Boston. And William Bradford of Plymouth said, it caused the sea to swell to the south wind of this place above 20 foot right up and down and made many of the Indians to climb into trees for their safety. It continued about five or six hours, but the violence began to abate. It blew down many hundreds of thousands of trees. The signs and marks of it will remain this hundred years in these parts. So he's just, Bradford's describing storm surge. And he's right about the trees knocking down. They, they would leave signs, uh, signs for not hundreds of years, for, but for decades. And then that same time he saw a, the moon suffered a great eclipse, he said, and uh, he attributed that uh, to the hurricane as well, but we know it's not. Then came the great September gale of 1815. It struck on Saturday, September 23rd, 1815, during the War of 1812. Noah Webster, historian, said the storm was a proper hurricane, and it was one of several severe storms that struck North Atlantic shipping lanes that season. It struck Long Island near Central Mariches, and Montauk Point Lighthouse was heavily damaged. In the East River in New York, wharves were underwater by three feet at 10 in the morning. And we know that the eye passed to the east of Hartford and Springfield, Massachusetts. The Hampshire Gazette called the Great September Gale of 1815 a tornado of wind and rain. Gale had six and a half inches of rain over two days in New Haven. The New Haven Register said that the storm drifted several hogs head of rum and molasses from the wharf. Eastern Connecticut, all of Rhode Island and east central Massachusetts was raked and the rain had a salty flavor. Houses and trees had white hue from the ocean froth, and it whipped 90-foot sprays from the Charles River. In fact, there's a report of a water spout even being seen on the Charles River 
during the Great September Gale, September 23rd, 1815. Let's track some major 20th century New England hurricanes. First, uh, the blue bar is the hurricane of 38. You see it goes up the Connecticut River Valley and hooks into the Great Lakes. Then the hurricane of 44 hits Hatteras and goes right up the uh, New England coast and uh, right north of Boston. And then the hurricane of 1954, it went essentially the same path as the great hurricane of 1938. But in comparison, Hurricane Katrina that devastated New Orleans dropped uh, less than eight inches of rainfall. The flooding was due to the levees that broke uh, and flooded uh, all the major parishes and uh, streets in New Orleans and surrounding communities. But in 2017, which was a very bad hurricane year, Hurricane Maria dumped 20 inches of rain in Puerto Rico. Uh, in 2017, Irma dumped 16 inches of rain in Florida. And in 2017, Harvey dumped 60 inches of rain on Texas. That would be 50 to 65 feet of snow. So the hurricane of 38 was an extra trop tropical cyclone. And basically, as the eye wall diminishes, the duration is prolonged. So this thing stalled over New England. As the eye wall collapsed, the speed of, of the storm uh, slowed down, but it just dumped torrents of rain on the area. If you look at the track of the great hurricane of 1938, starting off lower right-hand corner, 8.30 a.m. on September 18th, the next day, the 19th, moving up just east of the Bahamas. By the morning of the 20th, 8.30 a.m., it's, it's to the northeast of the Bahamas and due east of Florida, and then it races up the coast. It hits Hatteras at 8.30 a.m. on the 21st of September, and by 3.30 p.m., it hit New York. Again, just showing you the path of the hurricane where it began on the 10th, moved to the west, and then jogged north and eventually hit New England. And just showing you the categories here, it was a Cat 1 on the 13th uh, with 74 mile per hour winds. On the 16th, 98 mile per hour winds. On the 17th, it went from a 3 to a 4, from 115 mile per hour winds to 132 miles per hour. And then it uh, developed into a monster Cat 5 on the 19th with 160 mile per hour winds sustained. Then it went down to a on the day of the 20th, 155 mile per hour winds, but it struck New England uh, on the uh, 21st and New York with 127 mile per hour winds sustained anywhere from 121 to 127 miles per hour. Looking at these three images, first to the left, showing you the development of the hurricane, upper left-hand corner, September 9th and 10th, jogs west, and then the pink there, just as it hits the Bahamas, it turns into a Category 5, and then it streams northward. Below, uh, lower left-hand corner, shows you the path it took across Long Island uh, into Connecticut. And then upper right-hand corner, this shows you the path it took through Connecticut, through the Connecticut River Valley in Massachusetts, eventually uh, through upper New York State, through the Finger Lakes, and then it died in Canada. So this was the most costly disaster in American history up to that year, 1938. And it moved rapidly up the coast at 67 miles per hour. It moved an incredible 700 miles in 12 hours. And it also brought up tropical fish. And I'll harp on that in just a second. Landfall winds at 127 miles per hour, sustained winds at 121 miles per hour. The top winds in Boston were measured at 156 miles per hour, but at Blue Hills and Milton Mass, an incredible 186 mile per hour wind gust. There were 40 foot storm surges in some places. It hit at high tide. The seas rose 17 feet in some places. And salt water sprayed houses in Montpelier, Vermont, which is 120 miles away from the ocean. So the southern New England coastal areas were inundated, but most victims drowned. Some even had their clothes blown off. And the first impact of storm surge registered on seismographs in Alaska. And seawater destroyed vegetation 20 miles inland. So uh, virtually every New England community uh, was hit by this. And every resident that I've ever spoken to that was around during 1938 as a child, um, has a story about a broken branch falling just as they were called into the house. Uh, they didn't know a hurricane was coming. Nobody was warned. If you look at that summer of 1938, they had record precipitation in June and July, followed by a muggy August and a really muggy September. 
and then they had one inch of rain on both September 12th and September 15th. So the rivers were rising, and from September 17th through the 20th, there was constant rainfall in New England. And in fact, the heaviest rain fell the day before the hurricane hit on September 20th. In the Thames River Basin, they measured 60, 13 inches of rain in five days. Some areas even reported 17 inches in five days. So it's the perfect storm for a perfect storm. Uh, the hurricane had already, uh, before the hurricane, the rainfall had softened the soil, caused weak foundations of houses, and weakened the roots of trees. It was ripe for a hurricane. So its impact was exacerbated. If you were to pick up the newspaper on that Wednesday, September 21st, 1938, you'd see that the Treaty of Munich was imminent and that Chamberlain had handed over the Sudetenland and Czechoslovakia to Hitler through annexation, despite the protests of Winston Churchill. The Red Sox beat the St. Louis Browns 8-4, to four, but they remained eight, 11 games back in the American League. And the Lowell Sun said, the weatherman says more rain than cooler tonight and Thursday. The New York Times editorial talked about irony. The day the hurricane hit New York, they were bragging that, don't worry, you're safe. They said, every year, an average of three such whirlwinds sweep the tropical North Atlantic between June and November. In 1933, there was an all-time record of 20. If New York and the rest of the world have been so well informed about the cyclone, it is because of an admirably organized meteorological service. Wrong. You see, they had no... They had no tools whatsoever today. We have our computer, the, the weather report on TV, our phones. We have ra weather radar where we can actually see the fronts moving in and which direction the clouds are heading. But at Washington, at the Weather Bureau, 28-year-old uh, rookie Charles Pierce, he's filling in for two vacationing meteorologists. And after studying his maps and his data and his readings, he argues that the storm would be sandwiched between two high-pressure systems and then shot out like a pinball and head directly through uh, north through New England. And he was right. But longtime veteran Charles Mitchell ignores his forecast. Son, no hurricane has hit New Jersey during my tenure, and this current storm is weakening. And they didn't put out any warnings. So there was a barometric nose dive aboard the RMS Corinthia. They had a reading of 27.85, which is the lowest in recorded history in the North Atlantic. And this was off the coast of Virginia early in the morning of September 21st. Now on Fire Island, within two hours, they went from a low reading of 29.78 to an inconceivable low of 27.43 on the 21st of September. And then finally on the September, the 21st of September, a man from West Hampton Beach got a brand new barometer and he thought it was broken. It kept tapping it. It's reading 28. So he went back to the post office to return it. And as he was sending out the parcel, his house was blown away. Now on the Red Star Liner Konigstein, Skipper Alfred Leidig is measuring barometer readings of 28.40 with 100 mile per hour winds. And on September 19th, Reverend Ernest Gersey, he's an Italian Jesuit with 23 years of meteorological experience, and he's on board the Italian liner Conte di Savoia bound for New York, and he says that one of my children will be around in about three days. And this is after he referred to weather charts, barometric readings, and looked at the sky. Now it hits New York, their average gale wind is 65, mile per hour, 65 miles per hour at first, it's a tropical storm, but it, this deluge of four and a half inches of rain leaves the city at a standstill from 3 p.m. to 6 p.m. Thousands are marooned in office buildings. There's extensive flooding of streets and basements. And at 8.45 that evening, a power failure at Consolidated Edison left all of the Bronx and parts of Manhattan in darkness. And the only death was a hitchhiker who abandoned the stall car, the car that he was given a ride in, and he was carried away by the current. And that's New York City. And then Fort Schuyler Road uh, in Throg's Neck. They had nine foot waters at 7.30 p.m. And our first hero is J. Gilbert Finning, age 40, and William Billy McGrath, age 30. Now, during the evacuation of Fort Schuyler Road, Finning slipped and fell while pushing an elderly woman in a boat. Billy McGrath went after him and they both perished. McGrath posthumously was awarded the Carnegie Hero Fund Commission's bronze medal. And then in New York, well, they call it the Long Island Express. And look at the exposure of the southern coast of 
of Long Island, wide open to the winds of the Atlantic. And uh, it's very, very susceptible with their sandbars and their dunes and their island chains. And that's why they call it the Long Island Express. And there's a high flood risk there. And when it hit Long Island, the hurricane caused massive devastation. Now, there were some selfish people there, too. Uh, some wealthy homeowners forced their servants to remain in their mansions and their cottages while they evacuated, sealing their fate. One account had a family and friends packed into a car that drove off with their servants watching in ankle-deep water rising on the driveway. Some pets and horses were left behind to fend for themselves and subsequently drowned in the storm surge. And after a tree fell on his car, a man on Long Island frantically shook a police officer and he, and he said, that car is brand new. Who can I sue? Who can I sue? And there was substantial looting. Now, the ground became uh, was so soggy from the previous rains that all these old trees, 100, 150, year old, 150 years old, tumbled onto the streets. This is a devastated uh, village in East Hampton. And then the casualties mount West, West Hampton, Long Island, 28 dead, four missing, 153 out of 179 houses destroyed. They look like litter piles. Long Island Expressway, the trees fell like 10 pins along the highway. Bridgehampton, New York, it looks like a tornado hit. Of the estimated 2 billion trees that were lost in the Northeast, 3,500 trees were lost in the Bridgehampton, Sagaponic, hay ground area alone. The elms and locust trees that formed a half mile long arch over Main Street had been planted before the American Revolution and can still be seen in the canvases of many important art artists. So when the storm was over, 42% of the Main Street elms were gone. And we see that all the time where trees are blown over in heavy winds. It's a shame. This is not a pile of seaweed. This is a neighborhood on Nassau, Long Island. The ocean torn inlet between West Hampton Beach and Quogue, 400 feet wide and 20 feet deep, and waves broke on lawns one mile inland. Far Island, Long Island, six miles south of Bayshore across Great South Bay. Saltaire lost 125 houses. Kismet and Fair Harbor, 91 houses. Oak Beach, 29. Ocean Beach and Point of Woods also saw destruction. Now, this is now a sand dune, but over 200 homes had been perched on dunes 20 feet high here, and they were just wiped out by the hurricane of 1938. Frederick Foster Durham, he's 54 years old, the vice president of the Fulton Trust Company, and he's on his commuter train, uh, New York train, marooned though in Warwick, Rhode Island. It's normally a 15 minute ride. It took two hours on this day. He gets home by 8 p.m. as his wife is making dinner. He collapses and drops dead from exhaustion and exposure. Then at salt air, the morning after the storm, a young blonde girl sat on a box. As Chief Assistant District Attorney Lindsay Henry arrived, she asked him, could you assist us in the search for a body? Of course, he said, whose body is it? She shut her eyes tightly and sadly said, my mother's. Now some heroes, West Hampton Police Chief Stanley Teller and Officer Timothy Robinson saved 17 people. Halfway across the West Bay Bridge, they abandoned their two cruisers and waded and swam the rest of the way as the bridge was out. They saved a helpless woman and her three children in deep water on Dune Road, and they led all 17 of the people that they saved onto the roof of a house. Suddenly, a huge wave swept the house off of its foundation, and three hours later, they landed at Quag, having crossed the bay. I've said Quag and Quag to satisfy both pronunciations, but no lives were lost. Now I want to tell you about the flight of the Burghards. On Long Island, George and Mabel Burghard, along with their fox terrier Bitsy and their cocker spaniel Peter, with the caretakers, their servants, Carl and Selma Dalen, they had rented a cottage 75 feet from the top of a nine foot dune, 100 feet from Dune Road, and 75 feet from Coast Guard Station. The distance to the water's edge from the cottage was about 200 feet and the neighbors had a 30-foot cabin cruiser moored to the dock between the houses. At 10 a.m., the wind was strong from the north, it was overcast, there was drizzle, and the seas were heavy. An hour later, at 11 a.m., the wind shifted to the east and then to the northeast, now blowing at gale force. 
Now, Dalen, the service, the servant, he reports that water is bubbling through the concrete floor of the garage, and he thought it was fresh water from the bay, but he tasted it. It was salt water. It was the ocean water coming in underneath him. So Mabel Burkhardt decides to put on her swimsuit. It's noontime now. The neighbor's boat is drifting, and Burkhardt calls uh, James Ketchum, the chief botswain, at uh, Mauritius Coast Guard Station, which is three miles to their west. And Ketchum says, I'll be right down. At one o'clock, radio station WESF says, the West Indies hurricane is in mid-Atlantic. Wrong. It's right on top of them. And the electric power is still on. 1.30 p.m., friend Bill Ottman calls and says his garage has just been blown into the bay. By 2 p.m., 90 mile per hour winds were shifting to the east. Water was now two feet deep in their garage. Mabel, in her swimsuit, was sewing in the sunroom with her back to the bay windows. So Mrs. Dalen tells her to change her seat. And just as she does, the window blows out with glass shards everywhere. At 2.30 p.m., wind and rain is intensifying and their bathhouse is swept away. And by three o'clock, Berghardt tells Dalen to pack clothes and move to the third floor. 3.10 p.m., a wave suddenly breaks through the back door and sweeps Dalen off his feet. At 3.30 p.m., John Avery from the Coast Guard shows up, coming across the meadow. No time to lose, people. Let's get moving quick. High tide was due at 6.10 p.m. So Berghardt stuffs his tennis pockets for the match at Forest Hills the following day into his pocket. Wasn't going to happen. Four o'clock, Mabel uh, picks up Peter the dog and George picks up Bitsy. The Dalens, who are much older, are dilly-dallying. The wind is now up over 100 miles per hour and they have to make a half mile walk to the bridge across the bay for safety. Now, Mrs. Dalen is being nearly dragged by Avery, the Coast Guard man. But old Carl, he clings to the fence, fence post back down on the driveway as the group moves down the road. Imagine being a senior citizen trying to run into the face or the teeth of a 100 mile per hour wind. Carlton sat down on the fence. He's exhausted. Now he's 75 feet behind them, but he can't hear them call due to the wind. He has his head down. Mrs. Dalen is now hysterical for her husband. The wind suddenly shifts to the southeast at 110 miles per hour. 50 foot breakers roar over the sand dunes and flotsam drifts by in the raging sea torrents. There's a boat tied to the dock, and they suddenly move towards it. At 4.15 p.m., with a sickening crash, the Coast Guard station hits the bay and smashes to pieces. And just then, the line snaps, and the boat that they were heading towards, their only salvation, is dragged out to sea. Electric wires hit the ocean. Electrocution is a distinct possibility, along with the puddles there. Now, Mrs. Dalen. 50 feet behind her husband, she's refusing to move. She's calling to her husband who now lags 125 feet behind. The Berghards, with dogs under their arms, go out onto a broken dock and lie down, hoping to ride it like a surfboard. And just then a large flat piece of wooden siding comes by and Mabel, George and the dogs and Coast Guardsman Avery climb onto it. Now the wind had driven the bay water across to the mainland with such force that for about 200 feet, the bay bottom was dry. The Dalens now are helpless. They're left behind. Berghards and Avery jump off board and then they jump off the board and they wait for the giant wave that takes them 200 feet out into the bay. But six foot waves continually crash upon the board and they get washed off, but they climb right back on. They dodge flotsam, cars, jagged glass, boards with nails that were moving quickly by them. And they place their two dogs on a trailer little raft behind them. Bitsy gets washed off, but Peter the dog grabs him by the ear and drags him back onto the raft. They paddle around huge chunks of houses and debris. Ducks fly backwards at 40 miles per hour. Finally, the raft is grounded in berry bushes. Bitsy disappears in the brush, and they land one mile west from their house at Onek across the bay, and they head to higher ground at the golf course. They wave down a car and make their way into West Hampton. Avery moves off to help more people. Another story of West Hampton um, has a, a two fishermen um, that their boat is blown ashore. They knock on the door. Their clothes are literally blown off, off of themselves, and they're naked, and they knock on the door, and this uh, woman answers the door. She's shocked, and they need clothes. So what does she do? She loans them some of her dresses. 
So they hitchhike hike back to town, and when they're picked up by a police officer, they had some explaining to do. Now, some of their personal belongings are found miles away from their house, but the Burghards and one of their dogs are safe, along with Co Coast Guardsman Avery. Unfortunately, the Dalens didn't make it. Their bodies are located. Carl is ironically found near the golf course with a broken leg, and Mrs. Avery's body isn't found until days later. But John Avery is cited for, uh, for bravery, and they find wood pierced through wood like an arrow. And every street corner now has an armed man looking for looters. And there is 48 hour price gouging, that motif of selfishness. And residents said that awful sea smell stuck around for over a year. Quogue, the gymnasium becomes a mortuary before and after. The breach at Shinnecock Inlet. Before, after. The Shinnecock, Shinnecock Inlet, one month after it was opened by the hurricane, and that's when the Shinnecock Inlet was born, it changed uh, the fish you could find on each side of the bay and the water currents as well. How about the heroes of Stony Point? Beavers, 60 colonies of them, about 500 beavers from the Adirondacks imported in, built 60 dams. And the dams and Palisades Park held back swollen rivers and ponds, and these little guys worked all through the night to fortify their bulwarks the night before the hurricane and the night of the hurricane. Now, Long Mountain Beaver Pond actually doubled in size from five to ten acres due to the dam that these guys made of mud, sticks, stones, and sod. And it was 150 yards long and six feet high, and it held fast, only spilling 18 inches of water over its top. Cedar Hill Pond Dam doubled in size to eight acres. It was 40 feet wide and water rose two feet, but these guys saved five arterial highways used for evacuations. Long Mountain Road, Johnstown Road, U.S. Highways 6 and 17, and Route 9 West, the heroes of Stony Point. Now, the plight of the Park City Ferry. It left Port Jefferson, New York at 2 p.m. for a two-hour run its normal run to Bridgeport, Connecticut. Captain Ray Dickerson tried to turn back, but the wind shift forced him to drop and then drag anchor. Rogue waves filled the hold with over five feet of water, and at 3.15 p.m., the fires under the boilers went out, stopping their steam engine, and now they were at the mercy of the hurricane. Finally, their anchor caught at 7.30 p.m. as the crew bailed out the engine room. Most passengers had to sit in their cars for the entire night as water rose up over their wheel wells. Finally, the Park City was spotted by a Coast Guard cutter at 7 a.m. and towed to safety. But it was 21 hours. And the Ruth R., another boat, was blown from Montauk to Block Island and spent 18 hours adrift. Now the storm moves across Long Island Sound and hits Connecticut. The southeast coast of Connecticut is slammed from Saybrook Point to Stonington. And here's a derailed train outside of Stonington known as the Bostonian. 275 passengers on board originally. Many students were returning to prep schools. But at 3.30 p.m., the railroads were ordered to halt and train firemen were checking the tracks. The water was rising rapidly and they were thinking about evacuating. So uh, one of the engineers walks in neck deep water down to the light station and there's a man who's stranded on the light station and he says, what are you doing here? Go back. So suddenly a 30 foot sailboat smashed into the train and 160 of the remaining passengers were crammed into the engine and front car. You see uh, that uh, over 100, 115 to be exact, decided to get off the train when it was halted and derailed. So with all of the passengers inside the engine in the front car the engineer got the engineer the engine moving on the fourth try just as he was about to give up and they plowed through debris and dragging wires but the heroic act of one of his men who dove into the water and managed to uncouple the third cars and all the cars that were derailed behind them saved these people as they rode into uh, stonington station now here's an iconic photograph of the great hurricane of 1938 from Danielson, Connecticut, showing a 120 year old steeple toppling in mid-flight. Now let's go to old Saybrook, Connecticut, Catherine Hepburn. Now she was considered to be box office poison because she, she had just put out a film that 
tanked at the box office, and she had just auditioned for a new film that was about to commence production. Now, she's with her boyfriend, Red Hammond, and she decided to go out and play golf on that day of September 21st. It was humid and breezy, and on the par three, nine, ninth hole, she scores a hole in one and finishes her best round ever, nine holes, 31. Incredible. And afterwards, she and Red went for a swim in front of their house. And she stated about the breezy weather and rising surf. She said, something very special is going to happen. Now, their family had an elegant summer house there since the turn of the century. And their brother, Dick, was working on a script. Kate was waiting to hear back if she got the part of Scarlett O'Hara. And yes, gone with the wind. But she had just finished making Bringing Up Baby earlier in the year. And again, it didn't do well. But the water rose 17 feet high and Dick and Catherine got their family out as two chimneys crumbled and the guest cottage drifted a half mile away. Family heirlooms and jewels were lost in the mud. Days later, when Kate got home, she was on her knees, some say inebriated, and she was digging in vain for the family jewels. And Red gently tugged on her shoulder and said, Kate, it's time to leave. And Dick found his typewriter and all of his scripts perfectly intact. <laughs> Hollywood didn't want his scripts, nor did the hurricane. Now, the Battle of Colts Dyke, the Connecticut River in Hartford, there were 1,200 WPA workers, including World War I vets, college students, volunteers, trying to keep 100 million, 1 million tons of water out of the south end of the city that was previously devastated two years earlier in the Great Flood of 1936. Now, the Army engineers said there was a 50-50 chance uh, that the dike would hold uh, when it crested that 28 feet. So they had to decide, do they save the residential area or the commercial area? And uh, there was a plan even to dynamite Clark's dike should it not hold to save the industrial area. The arrow there points to the Traveler's Insurance Tower, and the clock in the old state house stopped at 4.10 p.m. Mrs. Carl Carlson, driving towards Guilford, Connecticut, was stopped in traffic as they removed a tree from the road. So she picks up the book she was reading. Just then a tree came crashing down on her, killing her instantly. The book she was reading was gone with the wind. Now here's a flooded neighborhood in Hartford. The river rose four inches per hour. Matt Strong caught a five-pound bass with his bare hands on Main Street. And Fred Fred Saul's apple tree was blown over and then later in the storm blown upright and it yielded apples for a few years after. Now it hits New London. There's a storm surge, 110 mile per hour winds and a great fire. This is the steamship Tulip washed along the railroad tracks in New London. New London was east of the eye and countless marine craft were destroyed <clears throat> by both the storm and the fire. Now, aside from a great fire in 1985, New London first was burnt to the ground by Benedict Arnold, turncoat. He burned the wharves, the homes, the church, the courthouse, and stores in September of 1781, ironically, one month before the British surrender at Yorktown. Now, the glow of the 1938 fire could be seen in the cloudy skies from the Long Island areas and Rhode Island coastlines. And it burned dozens of buildings before it burned itself out in the dampness because the wind served as an accelerant. And the five-masted schooner Marsala blew out of the water on Spar Yard Street, crossed the railroad tracks and struck the corner of the Humphrey Cornell building, somehow starting a fire. People think it was electric wires in the basement. Now, it was first reported this fire at 4.30 p.m. and all communication went down by 4.50 p.m. and fire departments asked ham radio operators to help out. Their fire department was stretched thin across the city. Now, embers were blown into Star, Green, and Pearl Street warehouses, so the entire lower harbor was now ablaze. The conflagration was left to feed on itself as water mains broke and downed trees impaired firefighters' mobility and hose spray blew back in their faces. It was only when the winds turned that the fire devoured itself. The Coast Guard was the first on the scene, followed by the Oswagachi and the Jordan Fire Companies, but the winding with the whipping winds shifted, jumping over to John Street. It ignited the New London News Company. And at 11.15 p.m., another fire started on Pequo Avenue near Green Harbor Beach. But 13 commercial buildings were destroyed in New London. 89 damage were destroyed. And this is New London after the fire. And you can see the image of the Marsala there. 
just devastated. Now in Cheshire, Patrick Joyce was killed when he was hurled against the brick wall of a prison building, except he was on the outside of the prison. And then the storm moved to Rhode Island. I'm going to tell you about the Moore family at Watch Hill. There were 11 people, including three servants, crammed into the attic of a sturdy house on the edge of Little Narragansett Bay. Now, Mr. Moore had suffered a, a heart attack earlier that morning, but somehow recovered and managed to board up the house. Suddenly, the roof was ripped off and thrown into the sea, and the entire family jumped onto an ad hoc raft. Huge waves crashed upon them, and they reported seeing hammerhead sharks, which were taken by the storm from Florida. They floated clear across the peninsula of the bay, and they drifted into a cove on Barn Island, and there they huddled in an abandoned barn, and they watched the glow of the new London fire. They were rescued the following day by lobstermen. All 39 houses on Watch Hill were wiped off the face of the earth. It's a sand dune today. If you went by it, you wouldn't believe that there was a neighborhood there. In a 20 mile, street, uh, 20 mile stretch from Napa Tree Point to Point Judith, there were 175 dead. And uh, a man who raised chickens had abandoned his chickens the day before on Long Island. They actually found one of his chickens on Napa Tree Point in Rhode Island. So here's Napa Tree Point, Rhode Island, August 1938. 17 people were swept away and never seen again. You can see it was just a sand dune in September a month later. The storm hit westerly at 3.50 p.m. and killed 100. Looks like an earthquake hit. Misquamacut Beach in Rhode Island. 194 of 200 homes were destroyed. 50 bodies were washed up in the sand dunes. Here, Misquamacut Beach, again, looks like a, a pile of debris and litter. It looks like a dump. Island Park, 19 dead. 198 out of 200 houses were destroyed. In Newport, Rhode Island, a storm surge of epic proportions funneled up on Connecticut Island in the middle of Narragansett Bay, and a full grade school bus was swept off a narrow causeway and into the raging storm surge, killing seven of the 10 children. Connecticut Beach, another 100 homes destroyed. Oakland Beach, 100 homeless. A woman said, my baby has just been blown out of my arms. Jamestown, Rhode Island. Now that looks like the fissure from an earthquake, from a fault line. And 14 people perished in Barrington. And here's the Rhode Island Governor Car Ferry in Jamestown. And over on Block Island, 86 of 100 boats moored there were destroyed. Three things you heard from the people there. Where do I go now? Everything that I own is gone. And I had no insurance. Now, the rats at Brown University. The calls began coming into a couple of local exterminators that mice had infested a woman's dormitory at Brown and that the rats were seen at the library. Were they seeking higher ground at College Hill? Now, many cats and dogs went missing on the morning of the hurricane. Squirrels and birds were reportedly moving about in an agitated manner, according to residents of Plymouth. Now, the Providence flood, the city was a perfect funnel and aqueduct. The storm surge struck at 5.15 p.m. just as power went out and as people were leaving their offices. A white wall of water rushed up Providence River and a deluge of water 13 feet high hit the city streets. Providence River rose 17 feet in 70 minutes. Appliance and consumer goods floated down the streets from department stores. Let's not forget 1938 were just coming out of the Great Depression. That's the Biltmore and Providence City Hall. Here's a canoe washed up at Exchange Place, downtown Providence. The Monhegan is wedged here in a pier near downtown Providence. Enlisting. I call the story Wedding Splash. Now, Joe Fogel and Lorraine Martin were scheduled to get married on the second floor in the ballroom of the Narragansett Hotel in downtown Providence. They had been on the society pages. It was one of the well-known weddings. And then, where's Joe? Cold feet? No, he was stuck at Union Station with his family. So 500 refugees sought shelter from the storm in the Narragansett Hotel. And what they do? They ate the wedding banquet right down to the crumbs and they drank all the champagne. 
Finally, Joe shows up at 11 o'clock and they're married by candlelight by an anxious minister. And then they have a short walk on muddy streets. The water had receded by 10 p.m. in Providence to their honeymoon suite at the Biltmore. I call this story the Mary Poppins of Brant Rock. A 10-year-old boy in Brant Rock, Mass, that's near Marshfield, saw that the weather was getting wild late in the afternoon of September 21st, 1938. So he decided to heighten the exhilaration of the storm by getting his grandfather's best umbrella out of the closet and climbing up onto the garage roof. He jumped off the roof, thinking that he might fly. As he tumbled to the ground, the umbrella was bent and broken. He received what was known as Red Bottom for his poor judgment. And that boy was my father. Now, I briefly alluded to the Great Flood of 1936, but it was the greatest flood in memory that struck uh, New England, mainly the Connecticut River Valley in 1936. It devastated five states in March of that year, and it burst the banks of the Merrimack, the Connecticut, and Kennebec Rivers, and as many as 100,000 people were displaced and 100 died. And today, a vast network of flood control reservoirs, dams, and dikes has been designed to prevent that from ever recurring again. And this is a picture of where mass, not, not along the ocean, but in the Connecticut River Valley and the, near the uh, Quabbin Reservoir. The Springfield Coast Guard. <laughs> now, an eyewitness to the storm surge that hit Horse Neck Beach to Buzzards Bay at five o'clock, he said, quote, and it sounds like a tidal wave, a long black band approaching, a solid black wall of water, looking like an unusually large black roller coming into the shore with its top being blown off so that it did not curl up and break like an ordinary wave. Now, there were 30-foot waves at Horseneck Beach, 41 lost their lives in Fall River, ships, boats, and barges were torn off their moorings and docks, and the oil tanker Phoenix spilled its cargo and was blown across the river onto lawns. In New Bedford, nine cotton mills were destroyed, 10,000 employees left without jobs, and the New Bedford economy would never recover from the hurricane of 1938. The Akushnet River rose 11 feet. 1,500 were left homeless in Fairhaven. The New Bedford Standard Times said, quote, the fishing fleets were overdue. Women stood with babies in their arms and watched the horizon in the ageless manner of wives whose men ply by the sea. Others went from boat to boat asking questions. Everywhere, the answer was a simple negative shake of the head. I haven't seen them. Look at the devastation of Westport Harbor. New Bedford. Woods Hole, Wareham. Now the, the Bourne and Sagamore Bridges had just been opened a few years earlier and here National Guardsmen are mourning the tragedy of a family of seven who lost their home as it was blown into the Cape Cod Canal. In Martha's Vineyard, they saw 25 foot waves at Chilmark. Bridge from Gay Head to Menemsha was blown away. This is Shawmut Beach, Rhode Island. East Brookfield, New Bedford, Springfield, East Bridgewater, Mattapoisa, Taunton, nobody was spared. Newton, Fairhaven, Where Wareham, West Brookfield, Mattapoisa, Boston, North Oxbridge, Putnam, Connecticut. Hit some of those, it looks like a bomb hit some of those buildings. Downtown Boston, Boston, Arlington Street. Here's the Mass State House on the Common. That tree is easily 150 years old. The hatch shell at the Esplanade. Charles River flooded. Providence. Look at that. A junkyard. One neighbor's house was blown away, the other stood. Here's the Monhegan in Providence. Lexington Green, the site of the first battle of the American Revolution. They lost some old trees. Exeter, New Hampshire now. Peterborough, New Hampshire. Look at the flooding there. Boston Post, 45 killed in wild hurricane. Property damage in millions, hundreds hurt by wreckage. Hurricane dead, 250, according to the Boston Evening Globe. 
Daily News says 322 dead in storm, 37 in New York. Deaths, deaths now 390, according to the Daily Record. Boston Herald says storm deaths mount to 515, 100,000 homeless. Some factoids. Peak steady winds are 121 miles per hour. 80% of all New England homes lost their power. Peak gust, 186 miles per hour at Blue Hill Observatory, Milton, Mass. Lowest air pressure recorded on land, 27.94 in Belfort, New York. <clears throat> the peak storm surge was 17 feet above normal high tide in Rhode Island. The peak wave heights, they reported 50 footers in Gloucester. The deaths were 700, 600 of them in New England. Homeless, 63,000 lost their home. 20,000 miles of power wire and power lines were knocked down. Homes and buildings destroyed, 8,900. 3,300 boats were lost. 26,000 automobiles were lost. Two billion trees. The cost was $6.2 million, $1938. $15 billion, 1998 Now today, that's north of $20 billion. And Shirley Ann Gatz was born at 3.28 p.m. at Eastern Long Island Hospital, just as the roof blew off and flooded the delivery room. So a lot of women who were expecting the pregnancies were induced by the low air pressure. So I always ask, were you born on September 21st, 1938? You're a hurricane baby. Looking at the uh, other great hurricanes of the 20th century, this is the great Atlantic hurricane in 1944. It brushes Hatteras. It was uh, right just west of Boston, east of the Connecticut River Valley. Edna in 1954 goes right through the Cape Cod Canal. Carol 1954, right up through the Connecticut River Valley, similar to the great hurricane in 1938. Now, Diane, uh, 1955, and look, you can see the first satellite image there of the hurricane. It goes into North Carolina, then comes back out into the Atlantic, uh, out of New Jersey, and scrapes the southern coast of New England. Gone in 1960, scrapes Hatteras, and then goes right up just to the east of the Connecticut River Valley. Again, a, an early radar image there. And then this is the 21st century hurricane blast zone. For those of you that live in Boston, it's a lowland area, um, uh, low to sea level. And it just shows you if a storm surge moved from uh, the southeast or from the east or even the northeast that Boston and its neighborhoods would be susceptible to storm surge, especially the Charles River and the Mystic River in places like Quincy and even all the way down to Hull, Hingham and Marshfield, situate. My resources uh, for this presentation was A Wind to Shake the World by Everett Allen. His first journalistic assignment was to cover the hurricane in 1938. Great book. Other resources, R.A. Scotty's Sudden Sea, uh, Cherie Burns, The Great Hurricane of 1938. It's a great audio book uh, that you may want to pick up and listen to it. And then uh, Aram uh, Gutsusian's The Hurricane of 1938. Of all the signals of the sea, none turns the faces of hardy sailors more grim than the flags that spell hurricane warning. One morning late in September 1938, the dread signals swung aloft along the Florida coast. Up from the West Indies, cradle of hurricanes moved the terror, a pit of low atmospheric pressure into which the air rushed from all directions to form a whirling, shrieking vortex of high wind and heavy rain. Hurricane! The Coast Guard watched it warily as it moved northward, paralleling the coast. That night it was off the Carolinas. Next morning it was off Maryland and Delaware, apparently swinging harmlessly out into the Atlantic. But a high-pressure area at sea deflected the hurricane back toward land. September 21st, in mid-afternoon, this tropical terror struck, swept over outer Long Island, swept into thickly settled, highly developed New England, struck with winds roaring 100, 150, almost 200 miles an hour. Tidal waves 30 to 40 feet high struck a section unprepared. The great wind-driven waves swallowed the sandy bulwarks of the coast washed away the pleasant beaches of Long Island's southern shore, literally changed the coastline. Bridges joining islands to the mainland were destroyed almost instantly. Men risked almost certain death trying to swim to their isolated homes, and the Coast Guard restrained them when it could. Flicking New York City with its outer fringe, the whirling storm smashed full force across Long Island. Thousands of homes along the seashore were shattered, mansion and modest home alike. The storm tore timber from timber, leaving only tangled wreckage. 
Millions of dollars worth of yachts and pleasure craft were smashed or swept far up on land, damaged beyond repair. Undermined roadbeds derailed trains. Passengers were marooned, some of them drowned. Great radio stations, keys to wireless communication for the continent went down as the tempest swung across Long Island Sound. Just back of New London's wreck-strewn waterfront, fire broke out in the night, sweeping four business blocks. Automobiles were crushed and twisted by falling trees and whirling timbers. Cutting a wide pathway of ruin inward from the sea, the storm piled up property damage in the hundreds of millions of dollars. The quiet dignity of colonial meeting houses was reduced to broken lumber. In one brief hour, part of the ancient beauty that was New England's heritage vanished forever. One of the structures which stood out the storm unharmed is this bathhouse at Scarborough Beach, Rhode Island, built by WPA. Even ocean-going vessels were tossed ashore by mountainous waves flying before the hurricane. Rugged buildings which had stood for decades along the stormy coast collapsed. Northward, the tempest swept across Connecticut and Rhode Island, across Massachusetts, into Vermont and New Hampshire, and on to Canada. With communication cut off, the full extent of the disaster was unknown for days. The nation waited fearfully for meager bulletins bearing sad tidings. On the watersheds of New England, the storm brought new torrents to rivers already gorged after three days' downpour. And so, flood was added to the burden of the hurricane. Sweeping down from their headwaters in the high mountains, swirling rivers rose to levels rivaling the disastrous floods of 1936, increasing the difficulty of removing refugees and of carrying food and health into the stricken area. The great dam at Holyoke was a cascade of thundering water as the torrent poured over its crest. Hartford was one of several cities along the banks of the Connecticut River to be partially inundated by rising waters. An immediate result of the storm was the complete disruption of transportation. Bridges were washed out, roads were blocked. Beneath the water in this low-lying underpass are an automobile and the bodies of its two occupants who were trapped. How to get necessary food and medical supplies into the storm zone became a major question. But local relief agencies went into action at once, and the task of rescue began. Neighbor hurried to assist neighbor. Private citizens volunteered to aid police, civic agencies, and the Red Cross. All available boats were drafted into service. Family after family was rescued when rising waters threatened their brief security. True to their tradition of valiant service, the Coast Guard met the emergency with swift action. From the coastal islands, some of which were completely swept by gigantic waves, Coast Guard boats brought survivors to safety. Further inland, armies of workers from private relief agencies, from nearby WPA and NYA projects, from CCC camps, as well as men recruited from every branch of the military and naval services, erected sandbag barriers to halt the rising waters. These were temporary expedients, but elsewhere the rivers were held in check by flood control projects completed by the WPA since the Great Flood of 1936. On the Nashua River at Pittsburgh and on the Connecticut River at West Springfield, these new structures proved their value beyond question. In three days, an army of 110,000 WPA workers had been shifted to emergency storm and flood duty. Every little man with a pick on this map represents 1,000 workers of the WPA. Manpower turning from regular public improvements and services into the breach in time of dire need. Where tracks remained to carry trains, thousands of these workers came by rail. Shock troops of disaster, someone has called them, because so many times in recent years they have provided the human sinews for great tasks of reconstruction. As the work of salvage began, sailors from navy yards and soldiers from army posts aided civilian police in maintaining order. Part of the army of WPA men worked feverishly, helping to locate those trapped or lying dead beneath fallen debris. One man was found alive under eight feet of wreckage 40 hours after the storm had passed. As New England rallied to the worst disaster of its history, WPA Administrator Harry Hopkins flew from California to Providence, the only transportation in the stricken area. He made a quick tour of the ravaged area to plan with New England leaders the task of cleaning up as well as the six months job of rebuilding public facilities. So I just want to thank you so much for joining me on this presentation, courtesy of our friends at Wakeham and the Wayland Council on Aging.
the great hurricane of 1938. I'm John Horgan, and I thank you so much for watching, and I hope that everything's well with you, okay? Take care.